of all, I just love skiing, like so much. There's nothing in the world that brings me more joy, ever. I'm scared to death right now, but I've got this. Like I know deep down inside, I'm capable of what I'm about to do. I felt like the rehab was pretty simple and straightforward and I learned how to appreciate my body and how to take care of it, what to eat and like to stretch. I was 18 so I felt like I was invincible at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Athletic Stance Podcast, a skier's perspective with your host, yours truly, Scott Chrisman. In this podcast, I have made it my job to go out and interview skiers at the highest level of the sport, to explore their perspective on life, what shaped and influenced them to become the person they are, and a whole lot more. First, let's take a look at our sponsors, because without them, none of this is possible. Our first sponsor is Northwest Tech. If you haven't heard of them yet, you're missing out. They hand bank customizable three layer outerwear to order in the Pacific Northwest. And that means you know that it keeps you warm, dry, and looking unique while you're sending it around the mountain. They've been generous enough to give me a coupon code for my listeners. Use the code AOS75 to get $75 off any custom piece of outerwear. Their site is in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by POC. POC makes the best helmets, goggles, and protective wear out there. They've been dedicated to protecting athletes since day one, and I wouldn't wear a different helmet, goggle, back pad, or hip pads. With their spin technology and VPD system, there are no other products on the market that are like it. Definitely go and check out pocksports.com and protect yourself today. What's up, guys? Welcome back to this week's episode of the Athletic Stance Podcast, a skier's perspective with Scott Christman. On this week's podcast, we have a guy who is not only a phenomenal skier, but has a personality larger than life, and it was a pleasure to talk to him. A big warning, there is... Lots of bad language on this episode. So if you don't like bad language, definitely do not listen to this. Tune in to one of mine that has it does not have the explicit label. Without further ado, this week's episode with Colby James West. James West from New Hampshire and I started skiing when I was like 13 I think started at 13 and then with the school program they like brought they brought us I went to public school so they just had like a you could go once a week and pay like 40 bucks or something I don't know maybe it was like 20 bucks I don't remember but um yeah and I went with the school and then I like was kind of on the ski team I had I didn't have race skis or like race outfit or anything I was on the I guess you could call it a racing team, but not really. I wouldn't consider myself a racer at all. But anyway, so I was, yeah, wow. My friend went to High North Ski Camp up in Whistler when he was 16, when I was 15. And then he came back and he was like, that was fucking awesome. You should go. So the next year I saved up a bunch of money and went to Whistler for High North Ski Camp with Shane Zox and Mike Atkinson. And I think Pep was there, Pep Fujas and some other Chris Turpin too. He was pretty big influence for me, but once I got there and I I started learning tricks, like right away, I learned how to do like cork nines and flat spins and you know, all the smaller stuff. And and then I was like, yeah, I could definitely see doing this for a really long time. So I, when I went to college, I went to college when I was 19 for like uh, one semester, no one, one year total. And, um, I was just skiing every day and like hitchhiking to the mountain and shit. And so, um, 
I told my mom, I was like, I think I could be a pro skier. I had some like sponsors, but they were just like product. And I had some connections with K2 and with Smith uh, goggles. And so they were like, if you can get out West, then you can stay with us, like stay in couches and stuff and come to X games and shit like that. Just as like a guest or whatever, like stay at the K2 house and shit like that. So, um, I quit school. Thankfully my mom was okay with that. My dad and I quit school and bought a car, a 1988 Saab for <laughs> like 500 bucks. And I lived in that and went out and tried to get to like all the contests and stuff. And, uh, not just contests, but like photo shoots, anything I could get into. I remember one of the first ones I ever did was with Nate Abbott, who's another who's a pretty famous photographer and skiing. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, so we did one with him and I was with Ben Chetler and where's Ben Chetler? Anyway, so when I was like twenty two when I was twenty one actually, and I was like uh still living in my car, basically like working all summer and then trying to be a skier in the winter and I was getting sponsors and stuff. And then when I was 21 K2, I was like, I need like 1500 bucks. I showed them like my finances, like everything that I'd spend. And I was like, if you can just give me 1500 bucks, I can make it work. And they were like, I don't know. We'll give you 500 bucks and like shit. So then vocal was like, we'll give you 5,000. And I was like, Holy shit. That's like a fortune. So I went with them and that was my first year in X games. I got in as a third alternate. And then when I like let you practice as a third alternate, which means three people would have to drop out and by then I was filming with level one as well with um, Josh Berman and Frito Cody and those guys. Um, anyway, so I got, got into X games and two people got hurt. And then Jakob Wester was like, this course is stupid. And I was like, you don't have to do it. And if you don't do it, then, I could do it. He's like, yeah, I'm just going to go ski back. Don't you fuck this? You can have my spot. And I was like, what? That's fucking sick. So then I got third that first year. And that was my beginning of being a skier. And then, yeah, then I got third the next year, then third again the next year after that. So it was pretty easy after that, I guess you could say. Took a while, but I got there. <laughs> yeah, totally. How did you originally make your connections in the industry? Was it kind of just by chance or did you like go um, when out? I went to, when I went to ski camp, Shane Zox, I don't know if you know who that is. He used to be big time, big dick swinger and skiing. And he, uh, he was the owner of the camp, summer camp high North. And he was saw a lot of potential in me, I guess. And he hooked me up with K2, just like free gear. And then he hooked me up with Smith as well. And then a Japanese boot company. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it. J generation gin some gin i can't remember but anyway he hooked me up with a couple sponsors and stuff and that was kind of like my initial introduction to it and that gave me enough well it gave me enough like confidence thing that i was doing the right thing to just keep pushing forward so yeah that's pretty much it As shane i owe a lot to shane zox with my ski career for sure as he would go to bat for me and also i think he was on the board of who decides who gets into x games so that year when i did go he probably had a little bit to do with that. It was him and I don't think Jeff Schmuck was on it yet, but it could have been like uh, maybe Doug Bishop. I don't remember. There was a whole bunch of them who were, you know, they have like a panel that decides who's going to go. So yeah, totally. Pretty much it. What years were, was that? That was 2008, nine, eight, nine. Yeah. Like 2008, I think it was the X games, my first X games. Sweet. Yeah. And then 2010, I won the, us open for big air that was pretty helpful as well yep but mostly because nobody showed up to that one <laughs> <laughs> it was just me and jossie actually jossie's staying in, in my extra room down here in hermosa right now but yeah yeah it was just me and him and he was like how old is he he's probably like 15 or 16 i guess but he was still super small and so he and it was snowing and in the, like in the finals it goes like top eight i'll go against each other so it was eight versus one so I beat that. And then I got all the way down to one uh, first and second place going against each other to see who's going to win. It was me and Jossie. And we were just like super, we didn't give a shit which one of us won, but I was heavier than Jossie. So I could go a little bit bigger and we we're just both doing switch tens. It was like the era of switch tens. I think Mike Clark probably should have won because he did a, he got third. He did a six switch cork 10 blunt or something like that. And it was like fucking dope. But I went like, all the way to the bottom of the landing. I think that's why they gave it to me. But it's so funny because I was starting in like maybe twice the height of the in-run that they had like arranged for us where the lights were. And so because it was so slow and snow and snowing, so they'd yell up to me and I'd drop from up there. And then Jossie had to start literally like 
another 300 feet up the hill from me. <laughs> it was so small. And uh, so they yelled at me, be like, we're ready for Josie. And I'd be like, ready, Josie, they're ready for you. And he'd be like, okay, dropping. And then you'd just <laughs> you'd see those little dot in the dark. And then you'd give me a high five on the way by and go down and do switch 10. <laughs> that was pretty that, fun. That's hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah, he was a little guy. Totally. I got to ski with him sometime around then. I think it was probably 2009. Yeah. Out at Copper with Chris Ben Shetler, Sage, Catabrico Losa, uh, Jossie, and Byron were out there. And yeah. yeah, I was like so surprised when I first saw him. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, he's a little guy. <laughs> totally. Uh, people are surprised by the size of Simon, too, because Dumont's fucking tiny. Totally. He's a tank, though. Dude, yeah, like a barrel. I play volleyball with him at one of the frats at CU, and oh, yeah. he's just, like, ripped, dude. Was that, was that with uh, that kid, Hugh? Uh, Hugh was probably around. I was with a couple of my other buddies, Mike and Mark. Yeah. Rat life. I used to hang out down in Boulder, it was? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to hang out down there all the time. It was fucking, like, fish in a barrel. <laughs> Sig, <laughs> uh, Sig new. I think was the frat. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was never in I went to college for that one year, but I was never like actually in college. So <laughs> I went sweet. for a year and a half and then like, yeah, I was just hanging around Boulder and like <laughs> kicking out with the crew and had a yeah. Yeah, couple homies there. Yeah, that's but, pretty much it for me too. And I had my motorcycle. So when it was like good weather, I'd because I was sponsored by Breck. So I would be up in Breck a lot of the time. But um, like they got me a, a place like they would like pay for my rent basically which is pretty fucking sweet and that is then, sick but in the summertime i would go over go down to boulder and just ride my motorcycle and hit on chicks and <laughs> be a fucking idiot <laughs> yeah good times do do what do what you did <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy being like being a pro skier and going to a college town i was like 22 or 23 so i'm like slightly older not actually in school and a pro skier and you're like this is the easiest thing on the planet <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to be like good looking or anything it didn't fucking matter <laughs> or all that suave right yeah yeah you're like give no shits and <laughs> didn't give a fuck dude <laughs> they loved you even more yeah can be kind of an intimidating group to come into though. Like <clears throat> with me, it was me and Peter Lennick and TJ Schiller, yep. Diamond yep. and Luke and fucking Pete's kid, Pete's brother and sister and, and, uh, Simon, just uh, that whole group. We all just like travel around and then the Canadians, Margetts and, and Dory and laws, <laughs> but like all of us together as a group was just like, people would be like pretty intimidated. I think. <laughs> We definitely yeah. had some days where people were like, who the fuck are you people? <laughs> we're like, we don't give a fuck. We're just going to fucking rage. Yeah, we are who we are. Deal with it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So did you ever have any, like, like you've taken a very different route, I think, than a lot of, you know, that a lot of skiers uh, have, especially with, like, you've always, one of the things that I've always loved about you is you've always had a personality. You've always, like, show, like been more than just, like, more than just a skier. Like, you're an entertainer as well. Yeah, Where I guess I think of myself as an entertainer more than anything. I mean, yeah. as a skier, you are an entertainer. You can say you're an athlete, but even athletes are entertainers. You know, like basketball players are fucking entertainers. Yeah. They're there for. So yep. yeah, but with, with skiing, I just never felt like I was, it felt weird to me to be entertaining. I, I don't know. I don't know whether it was because I didn't think that my skiing was maybe like, I had definitely had times when I tried really hard to make like a segment where it would be like really baller. Like I'd, like it's like the best tricks I could possibly do and all that stuff. And it was, I just had so much more fun with making fun of it instead. And it's not like I'm making fun of it in a way where I dislike skiing or anything. It was just like making fun. I just didn't like people taking it so fucking seriously all the time. <laughs> I was like, who gives a shit? We're fucking skiing and they're paying us to do it. Yeah. Like, are you going to think of yourself as like a fucking golden dot or something, you know? Yeah. But uh, also I didn't really feel like I was entertaining people unless I was making them laugh. So when I would make a segment, Actually, really, the first segment that I did that was like what I realized that was something I could do was um, I did a segment with Tom Jones song. It's not unusual. I think it was in the movie Claim. 
I was um, just going to say. And yeah. And they like, they, well, I was in Monaco and we're staying on the sick boat and we're building a jump with Yoon up in Italy. And, uh, it was shitty weather. And I had just done like, I had just done ski tour or something like that. It was like half pipe event. And, um, and I was like, I got to go to the final stop of this. And like, well, just hold up for the weather. Like, wait for it. Like you already had a good year. You won the open and you got the, you've got a medal. So at X games, so like just hang out and round it out with a really good segment, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. Then the guy from the competition called me and he's like, Hey man, like you, if Simon doesn't do well, if he gets third or less, then you're going to win the whole thing and you win like 50 fucking grand. And I was like, Oh, that might be a good reason to go back for this event. So I left and, um, the MSP guys were like, well, you don't have enough footage to have a full segment. We'll just have to like put you in with somebody else or something like that. And I was like, no, no, we can like figure it out. And the whole time I was in Monaco, I was just singing that stupid, it's not unusual song. <laughs> I was like, can you guys get the rights to that song? And they were like, well, we'll look into it. And it was only like five grand for the rights. I don't even know. I'm pretty sure they got the rights. So they told me they did anyway. So <laughs> yeah, they got the rights to the song. And then I just memorized all the words and we just made a little music video of me singing Tom Jones and skiing. And that was the first time I was like, that's more like what I want to do, like entertaining it as well as, as the, as skiing. Yeah. That was one of my favorite movies that you were in. Cause you crushed it with some like crazy switch laid out, switch backflips on that, <laughs> ju- <laughs> that jump. And, um, like that movie just went ham all around, but yeah. That and then like you had the mini park set segment with like it was like nine switch seven switch seven yeah. switch nine or whatever it was I don't remember exactly what it was but all yeah. that um dude yeah that was definitely claim still is one of my favorite ski movies out there for sure love that movie yeah I haven't seen it in a long time but it was fun that's for sure <laughs> yeah that's awesome that that creativity where um like blossomed from just having to adapt the way that that you did there yeah pretty much I mean, and that's actually kind of like a lot of times when i make like a segment that's more fun or i'll do something like like i still do a lot of entertainment stuff with monster as well and like i, I really enjoy that kind of like well here's the situation we're in here's what we're gonna have to make like uh you know some super sessions you know when john sims and i made my friend is a pro that one was like really yep that was like basically it was tenor Tanner Hall and, and Sammy Carlson were supposed to go together for Team USA. And uh, then Tanner was like, no, I don't want to do it. This is a big Ewan Olsen dick sucking fest or something. And then Sammy, Ewan called me and he was like, this is like a week before the event or like a week and a half before the event. Ewan called me. He was like, Tanner dropped out. Like, you got to call Sammy and see if you want to go with him. But like me and Sammy weren't really all that like buddy, buddy. Um, as you can tell when I make fun of him in the beginning of the thing. So, uh, we were just not like on the same page and he was like, well, just add, I'm like, I don't think he's going to want to go with me. And I was like, I don't honestly don't really want to go with him either. And he was like, well, just call him. So I called him and he was like, nah, I'm going to like bring my, I'm going to bring my buddy from home. And I was like, all right, sweet. Well, you didn't want me to ask him, but whatever. And then Sammy dropped out and you and called me. He's like, you're in. This is a week before he was like, you're in, you got to find two filmers, uh, another skier and a photographer. I'm like, fuck. So I was working with Thomas at the time and then Mike Thomas. And then, um, who else was there? Alex O'Brien and Josh Finbo. And Finbo was like 19 years old. It was like when he first started really good cinematographer though but he had a red cam and shit and he was working with the MSB guys. Anyway, so they all, we all went up. Like I called John, I called Sims and I was like, Hey man, cause he's been one of my best friends for a long time. I was like, Hey man, I gotta go. Like I have no idea who to bring with me to this event. Like, I don't, I don't know what athletes to bring. I like went on new schoolers. Even, and I was like, Hey y'all, like who the fuck should I bring? People were like Bobby Brown. Cause Bobby Brown was brand new then. And, and LJ Stradio. And I kind of knew Stradio. I didn't really, I knew Bobby a little bit, but I was like, I don't know if that really matches all that much. And like, I don't really know these kids. And, and then I called John back All right. and John was like, I don't know. I should bring this guy, this guy. And then he called me back probably about an hour later and he goes, fuck it, dude. You should just bring me. Who gives a shit? Let's just go. Like, just bring me. I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I was like, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so me and John, we were all five of us are sitting in the hotel room in Norway. And I was like, okay, guys, we're not leaving this room until we come up with what our theme is going to be. Cause everybody already knew of like, at least for me, that I was going to most likely try to do some sort of comedy thing or some shit. And we were singing that song by Mano and T-Pain the whole time, me and John, because we thought it was fucking awesome for some reason. And and uh, and then I was like, we can't leave. Like, no real partying. All we're going to do is ski. 
and try to come up with what our theme is going to be. So the first, first like two or three days, even we just sat in the hotel room. We're like trying to think of what the fuck we're going to do. And, um, Thomas was, he's super, he's really good. He's a really good editor for comedy and stuff like that. And, and so I was like, can we like, John actually goes, um, well, the only reason I'm here is because I'm friends with you because you're a pro. <laughs> I was like, well, you're still a pro there, John. He's like, no, I'm not. If I could quit like four years ago, like just we're making jokes about it. And then he, he must have said, one of us must have said something like with that song. Cause we were singing it like my friend's a pro. We were like, oh man, we should totally fucking do that. So Thomas looked up like the rights to the song or something. And it was like, you was super big on like, you have to have the rights to the song. And I talked with um, Darren Rayner cause they were there as well as team Canada. And he was like, I'm not getting fucking rights to the song. I'm just going to take songs that are like kind of obscure and hope that nobody says anything. And I was like, good enough for me, man. So we just like stole the soundtrack to Mano and T-Pain. And then just for the rest of the time, we we're just trying to write the whole thing and just film those stupid stuff. And people were like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Cause we'd be like rapping on the camera and shit. And like, they just see us doing crazy shit. And we were like, we're even really doing anything. I mean, the, the really the only trick I like, the only good trick I did for the whole thing was like dub chord 12 blunt, I think. And then like some zero spins and that was it. And then, and John hadn't like skied and hit huge jumps for so long. He's doing like switch nines and like radio nines and shit. We were definitely way behind on the skiing, but I remember Jossie was there and he liked that song. We were walking, we were actually walking on our way to the last ceremony. Like we were pretty excited to show everybody what it was. You had to submit. So Mike Thomas stayed up the entire fucking night and we watched, he'd stayed up all night till like it was light out again. And me and John came back from the bar, like super drunk. And we're like, like we want to watch it. And he's like, well, it has to be in in like 20 minutes. Like I have to submit it. And we're like, ah, fuck it, show us. So he shows us and we were just laughing so hard. And we were like, this is fucking magical. And then there was like a couple things. He's like, oh wait, what if I tweak this? Is this funny? And I'm like, oh, this is fucking awesome. So we like sent it down to the judges. And uh, and then we were walking down with Jossie and me and John knew all the lyrics to the actual original T-Pain and Mano song, um, all the above. And so they, <laughs> they're like, we're singing it. And Jossie's like, they're like, how do you guys know all the lyrics to that? That's ridiculous. And we're like, they're like, oh yeah, I just really like the song, but like didn't want to tell them what we had done. And we get to the <laughs> venue and it was Turpin. Chris Turpin was one of the judges and there was, oh geez, I can't remember the other judges there. Maybe it was Schmuck or somebody, but yeah, I guess it would have been Schmuck. But Turpin was like, dude, he like came up and hugged us. He was like, we watched before we went to the next video, we watched yours like six times. And we were like, fucking sick. And John was like, so we won. And he goes, no, you got dead last. <laughs> Like, what the fuck, man? We got dead last because it turned out that the way that it was judged was like, by, it was like a big air. And that was like, so all they did was judge tricks. They didn't even judge like the edit or like any of that other shit or like the entertainment value or any of that stuff. They just judged based on the tricks. And I was like, whoa, we definitely fucking lose in that category. Like, that's it. I, the only, we got zero points across the board. The only one we got points on was. Alex O'Brien, our photographer, because Jossie's photographer forgot his fucking lights and couldn't do like night shoot shit. So, but I was kind of, I kind of felt bad for Alex because he fucking, it wasn't, it was just part of the judging system. It didn't have, it was no reflection on how good his pictures were or anything. So it's kind of stupid. But anyway, we lost completely. And then they changed the rules for the next year and like the most fun video won, the Canadians won. Yeah, it was good. It was so funny because we like came back and, the Whistler went to WSI right away and like one of the hugest fans of the video was Mike Douglas and he was just like I heard him from like a, like we were at the bottom of the big air and I'm hiking up and I just hear him like what? Like oh my god you fucking made that shit. It was so funny and I was like yeah. Approval from Mike Douglas that's fucking sweet. Right? Like that's all that matters. Yeah exactly. Yeah, that was pretty fun. I guess it's probably really my one of my only <laughs> um, what, do you, what do you call it? Like one of my only tributes to skiing or like yeah it's one of the things i'm stoked i left behind <laughs> where did the like entertainment like did you were you always like just an entertainer in in school and all that or has it just been like yeah how how did that come about well, i like used to do voices and shit all the time like i'm sure my sister and my mom who i grew up with they probably real sick of me doing voices but i would just like mimic things and i could hear stuff and repeat it like do accents and voices and all that shit pretty easily. And I just did all the time. And then of course, within skiing, there's not a lot of people that can do both of those. So every time someone wanted to do an interview or something like that, everybody just asked me to do voices and shit instead of doing the same old, like, yeah, it's like super stuck for this year. I want to win the fucking Olympics and shit. 
So that became more, and I enjoyed doing it, made everything easier to deal with as well. So yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, I had to go for sponsors that were down with that instead of wanting someone who was like, I'm gonna fucking win everything. So it was different, but I don't know. I mean, now I do voiceovers and things, but I mostly got into it through skiing. Like I just did a voiceover today for Whistler. Like, an, like their national ad or something. I think it's going on TV, but it's pretty sweet because like I do stuff for snowboarding and skiing. And like I started getting into drift car driving and shit like that. So I've done stuff for like tools, snap on and just like word of mouth type of thing. But that's yeah. the voiceover stuff. You know? I've tried to do other things. Like I did the Colby West show, which was a live audience TV show in Whistler, but it cost me like 15, 20 grand of my own fucking money. And it was fucking worth Like nobody gave me bro deals on anything. And I was like, so there was like 200 people there. We had like a set. It was exactly like um, like a late night show set up, except for action sports for like skiing and snowboarding. So I had Dingo on there and Gus right after he won his medal and Tom yep. Pettit. And we made the whole thing, filmed it. We had like six cameras going and Darren Rayner was the essentially director and producer. But it was so fucking stressful and it's on my YouTube page, but it's, it was whatever. It's not, it's not like it got a lot of hits or anything. It was like a live show. I mean, I would consider it a success and like people went that went were entertained and they thought it was good, but it was so funny because I like, described it to people and I'd be like, be like, it's a live audience TV show. So basically it's exactly like take Jimmy Kimmel and replace him with me. And the live audience still have TV and then replace the guests with skiers or snowboarders. And still, I had so many people come up to me. They're like, that was way different than I thought it was going to be. I'm like, it's, it, I told you exactly what the fuck it was. It's a fucking late night TV show for action sports. And that's it. So, yeah, that was interesting. But right now, I, I'm actually, I have a meeting on Tuesday. I just wrote a movie. That's definitely more entertainment type style. <laughs> so when I came down to Hermosa, I met a bunch of stuntmen. It's like kind of like meeting peers, you know, like they're definitely a lot like skiers. And one of them lives in Tahoe or he's from Tahoe. And my buddy Casey, and he was like, we should make movies together. And I was like, sweet. So I just started writing, writing. And now I got a movie we're trying to make. That should be interesting. <laughs> Dude, super cool. I just got approached by a videographer um to make a movie a ski movie for next year so that's pretty exciting super fun when you find like-minded individuals that are like that have the talent on the other end of the screen yeah. you know yeah that's like <clears throat> that's always super fun someone that you can be creative with and someone that yeah yeah well that's I moved awesome down here and i sold i had i sold my car and everything and i just moved to hermosa i didn't even know anybody in hermosa but I know people in LA or whatever, but I just don't know anybody here. And I, all I had was a skateboard. I didn't have a bike or anything. And I skateboarded at FedEx. It was raining out. And I was like printing off something or drift car shit. And uh, I hear, are you Colby? And I was like, yeah. But like, maybe if I'm in a ski town, like I might get recognized by someone who watches ski movies or whatever. But like in Hermosa in LA, it's like fucking impossible. And he was just like, are you Colby? I was like, yeah, who are you? I was like, I'm Casey. I'm from Tahoe. And i have just literally, I have like one ski movie and I watched it the other day. It was like seven sunny days or something. And, uh, he's like, I just saw you the other day. He's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh, I just moved in. I don't know anybody. He's like, well, I live down the street and he lives like in the bloody lived two blocks from me. He's like, we should hang out. I'm like, sure. And he's got like a fucking sick sailboat in the Harbor. And he's like a stunt man. He just bought an airplane. He has an airport hangar. He's got like all this crazy toys and awesome shit. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, you should be, I was like, I always wanted to be a stuntman when I was younger. And he was like, yeah, well, you took the right path. And he was like, I always wanted to be a pro skier. And I was like, do we just become best friends? <laughs> like, <laughs> just different times in our lives, you know? But yeah, yeah, totally, man. Yeah. That's cool. awesome. It's crazy the serendipity that like he was watching that movie recently. Yes, and, you one, know, just like one ski movie and his girlfriend, like, was like, do you want to keep this? Was like going through old shit. And he was like, oh, let's watch that right now. And he watched it and then saw me like oh, like three days later. It's crazy. Dude, yeah. so wild. Yeah. So wild. Can you share what the the movie is going to be well, about at all? Yeah, kind of. My friend, um, my friend Dane, he's a, he's a musician down here and he, and he also sells weed. And so um, he's been selling weed, I think. I mean, he worked for a weed distribution company or something, but anyway he's a musician and he has this old shitty minivan it's like a 1990s minivan and he keeps his music equipment in there when he goes to all these shows this isn't still real life but he 
I was with, we were riding somewhere in his van. I was like, fucking smells like shit in here. Like what happens if someone breaks into your van? Like you have like $5,000 worth of shit in here. And he's like, well, I guess I'll just be fucked. <laughs> like, Oh my God. So I kind of started with that and I made a story about him. He gets an offer to sell like cocaine and he's like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. It's too heavy. And then all his shit gets stolen. And then he ends up having to sell cocaine. And then another one of my buddies who has a yacht down here, like a bigger boat, I made him the bad guy. And so he's, and they're all stuntmen too. So it's going to be a lot of food and drug dealers and music. It should be pretty fun. And driving too, because I've been getting to drift car driving. Yeah. Dude. I can't wait for it. Sounds <laughs> awesome. We'll see if it gets made. I got it. It's like, it's like 90 pages and um, we have some meetings about trying to make it better and shit like that, but it's pretty much done. You know, the script is done anyway. I was thinking about, it, I was like, yeah, I would love to make movies, you know? And, and I like, didn't, I was like, oh, I should write a movie or write a script or do something. And it's kind of the douchey thing to do, you know, like everybody wants to try it, especially in LA. Like everybody's like, yeah, I wrote a movie, like read my movie. And I'm like, that's fucking stupid. But then Casey was like, and then you know how to write. I know a whole bunch of producers. I work on movies all the time. You know all these people that work on movies. Like, if you write a movie, we could probably actually get it made. And I was like, all right, well, I guess we'll give it a try. I started writing about six months ago. And really, I just finished about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I think. But yeah, it was really fun. It's actually not as hard as I thought it was going to be. I just looked at it like my old ski movie segments where, like, like what happened with... um with going to Unols and super sessions is like, okay, you have to make a video. It has to be around skiing, has to have skiing in it, has to take place in Norway and Sweden, like all the criteria. And then you're like, okay, what can we do in this space? I've done that before. I did another rap video with Jossie actually at X games ball and kind of, which definitely was not as good as my friend as a pro, but that was the same thing where they're like two days before X games, their monster was like, Hey, can you make a video for us at X games? And I was like, yeah, what do you want? And they're like, give us a list. So like on the list was rap song, which I wish I hadn't fucking put on there. And so they're like, yeah, we want a rap song. I'm like, God damn it. Okay. So I called Jossie and calls the musician friends and shit. And we finally got a track. We made the track on Monday and wrote the whole thing and then filmed the whole week and had it out by the next Monday. So it was like, what's the criteria? What are we doing? How do we make everything work? So I have quite a bit. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't say quite a bit. I have enough experience like creating something from scratch with criteria that you have. So basically I knew that for the movie I had to have not had to, but it'd be nice if it took place down here because I have access to like boats, sailboats, planes. One of my buddies is a helicopter mechanic. So we got helicopters and Sick. a lot of my friends are stuntmen. So we have a lot of stunts and action, that type of thing. And then Dan can play yeah. music. And so it's basically like, that's my criteria. What do you do with that? And I was like, stuntmen and helicopters, boats, and music he'd probably be the drug world <laughs> so right just started from there yeah, it's crazy. we'll see if it uh, yeah dude that'll be that'll be awesome that'll be incredible to watch play out i uh i just wrote a book actually and i thought that that was going to be a lot more intimidating than yeah the thing is like uh, starting that shit you know like yeah. You just had to start. What was the exactly. Called? It's called, <laughs> this is super funny. Cause I was looking at one of your posts. It's called hashtag YOLO. If you do it right, once is enough. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I've, uh, you know, I've messed up a lot in my life, quote unquote messed up, you yeah. know? And, um, there, you know, I've learned from a lot of my mistakes and I wouldn't really trade any, you know, any of the experiences for anything I've, I've like learned and, and become better because of it. But it's just like, I think that a lot of people can get down on themselves while they're in that learning process on their way to success. Yeah, dude, it's and heavy as fuck. Yeah, totally. And so like basically about mastering yourself as you go out and try and make an impact in the world. Yeah. Yeah, short read. It's going to be like 50 pages, just like consumable really quickly for targeted at generation Z and millennials. Yeah. So, we're going to yeah. have like on Amazon or something. Amazon. And then like, if it starts to get more successful, then talk about putting it in actual brick and mortar locations and stuff like that. But it's more just like a tool for me to leverage for more public speaking and like, you know, creating, 
creating an impact in the world. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. But I mean, oh. like you were saying, it's actually not like the thought of doing it seems so fucking intimidating at first. Like writing a movie, you're like, oh god, where do I fucking start? And then as soon as you do start, you're like, oh wait, no, I know what the fuck I'm doing. This isn't that bad at all. Yeah, and this is gonna lead to this, and then it starts to be fun, and then you're like, you like follow the path all the way down, and then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, whoa, I'm like more than halfway, or I'm like, you know, I'm like this far in, and you're like, holy shit, yeah. I actually like. Well, also, this is. I mean, speaking on that though, maybe our your book sucks and my movie sucks, so we don't really know yet. <laughs> It's true. It's very true. We could just be like, but, oh man, that was easy. People are like, it's easy because you fucking suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I think, so if it sucks, at least we're fucking doing it. Exactly. And like, I'll learn. If people tell me it sucks, I'll go ask everyone exactly how it sucks. Yeah. And then I'll fix it and make it better and like iterate and come back and be like, well, what about this one? You like this yeah. one? <laughs> you know, like yeah it's it's not that I, yeah i think it's good not to attach like your self-worth to the to the end product and just be like you know i'm stoked that i'm a part of the process like having fun i can tell that you have fun with all of your creative processes yeah. and so like you can't i don't i think if you, if you have fun making something it's impossible to regret it coming to fruition you know what i mean oh yeah for sure it's like yeah, the, I mean, it can be super stressful when you're doing it, but like, even like I was talking about with that video with Jossie, like the rap video, it didn't come out exactly how we wanted it to, but we fucking did it, finished it, and yep. learned a shitload from that. I mean, I learned how to do like, um, that was one of, sorry, is there an airplane going by? I learned uh, how to do, uh, not how to, but I learned the value of doing like storyboarding. For that one, I drew out every single picture. Like in stick figure, kind of how I saw it going, and then gave it to Finbo. Josh Finbo was the filmer on that one too, and he like if you look at the pictures of what I drew, I drew it on the hotel fucking stationery room, <laughs> yep. and then I drew it from beginning to end, and then I gave it to him. And then if you look at the shots afterward, it's exactly what I drew on the thing, and that's a really cool feeling when you have like a vision for what it's gonna be like, and then at the end you're done with it. Even if it's not like the greatest fucking thing in the world, like it just part of the process is fucking sweet. I think. Yeah, totally, dude. I I had uh, a guy who does mountaineering and um, long distance running. Yeah, dog's trying to go wild right now, and we we're talking about like longevity in the sport. And uh, TJ David, I don't know if you know him. He skied skis for Kesley now, now that they've taken a completely different direction yeah. than when you skied for them. Yeah. I skied for them and I skied on your skis. I was just looking at a pair that got turned into a coat rack after they fell apart. Those are good but skis, I skied. Man. Dude, the James and the West were two of my favorite skis yeah. ever for sure. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. It was like, I mean, I know I'm not sponsored by them anymore, so I don't have to promote them, but those are like, I guess, cause I've had a bunch of different, um, pro models kind of like I helped well, like vocal had those symmetrical skis. Those was my, I really liked the silencers from K2 when I was on K2, but it was right when I was leaving and the public enemy was the first one I skied on. And then I went to vocal and they had the wall, which was symmetrical. And I was like, this is the fucking shit. I love those skis so much. So then the next year I went to corrupt or like a couple years later, I went to corrupt and they were like, what kind of ski do you want to make? I was like, make this, make the D star troublemaker, but symmetrical. And they were like, fuck yeah, we can do that. So they made that. And that was the best ski I'd skied on. And then I went after that to Kesley and Kesley was like, what do you want to make? And I was like, all right, I think I got it down by now. <laughs> I want it to be a mix of these. I like this skinny one, but I want to do a backcountry one that's fat. And then I want them all to be symmetrical. And they're like, sweet. And actually when they, when we were first talking about, they're like, we want to highlight this hollow tip technology with the thing on the, you know, it's like, the open thing and i was like yeah cool like just like a promotional gimmick or whatever it was and then i put them on and you swing your leg and there's like no swing weight and you're like what the fuck like it it actually took away a lot of swing weight which is really cool definitely yeah, pretty good time yeah. and buttering on them i just loved those skis they just started to deteriorate deteriorate on me after about like a month and a half or two the edges because i was like hitting rails pretty hard and oh, really Huh. Yeah. I guess I, since I was sponsored, I didn't really, I kind of ran through a shitload of them, but I never really had troubles with them. 
Yeah. Yeah. Fuck those things. No. I still have them. I still ski on those when I go skiing. I have a pair of what was later. It was the XX110 the year after right, you. Yeah. I think. They, they, those are probably about, they were the same thing, weren't they? It was the exact same thing, but it was just lime green and didn't say what uh, West yeah, in the didn't middle. Didn't it said XX110. Sweet. <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, it was, it was totally the same thing, but I still have a pair of those. They're so beat, but I get out on them every once in a while. Yeah. So much fun. But yeah, what I was saying about the, uh, flip it back real quick to the, um, like the mindset that it takes to like be in, um, it's the same mindset in mountaineering where like you have to be okay with turning around or not accomplishing the mission as like being a creative, you have to like fulfill it to fruition, but you have to be okay with the fact that like it might suck. You might think it's the most awesome thing in the world. And everyone else might be like, uh, you just wasted like, I want my hour of (laughs) my hour of time back, you know? Yeah, And that's definitely happened to me before. (laughs) I've had segments where I was like at the end of it, you're like, all right, we did it. And you're like, it's done. Like, this is the best we could do. And then you look at it and you're like, ah, fuck. <laughs> this is just a bit. Or you watch it like a, a while later and you're like, damn it, what the fuck was I thinking? But that's part of it. That's, why, that's actually another reason why I wanted to try to make a movie is because I haven't done it yet and I want to make movies. But at the same time, I, um, I know that it's going to take a while. Like I've made probably 30 different ski edits and ski segments and things like that over my career, like major ones anyway. And like it, it, it's not, some of them are good, some of them are bad. And the way I'm looking at movies, it's like, okay, this is my first one, but like, I'm not, I don't need to hold on to it. Like it's the only thing I'm ever going to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And like, obviously you want to bring the best product that you possibly can to your, like your friends, your peers, your colleagues and the audience and everyone who's going to see it. But it's like, it's not the end all be all. It's not like you have to be so attached to it being perfect that like, I think so many people get so attached to perfectionism that they never actually put themselves out in the world to do anything cool right. you know yeah they just freeze themselves in the yeah. head it's de- i definitely have run into that so many times i had like i played uh like even when i was playing music one of my friends one of my best friends he's a super good musician he's been playing since he was like 12 years old and he and i started playing super randomly i was living with henshaw with russ henshaw and we were once there actually for something and he brings his guitar with him everywhere same with andreas hope they are nasty guitar players and uh and, um, so Russ takes out his guitar and starts playing. I was like, man, I wish I knew how to play guitar, man. Someday I'm going to learn. And he goes, mate, I'm fucking sick of hearing you say that. We're going to go down to the guitar shop right now and get you a guitar and you're gonna, for like 150 bucks and you're going to learn how to fucking play guitar. I'm like, okay. Play. So he made me go and help me pick out a guitar. And then, uh, and then I just had this app, the tabs app where you just looked up whatever the fucking fingerings are for the guitar. And I started playing. And then I was playing, I've been playing for about two years, just fucking playing in the living rooms or whatever, hotel rooms and shit and singing and just dicking around. I'm still not very good. I can just strum. I can like barely pluck it, but I can sing and play at the same time. So, um, I was, I, I was at X games probably about, I guess it was four years ago now, but I was, I wasn't competing. I was like announcing or something. And one of the producers, she was like, Hey, like I heard you play guitar. And I'm like, like kind of like I was playing for like two years and she was like, Oh, you should come down to jam with me and my girlfriend stay with us instead of getting a hotel room. It was I, me and my girlfriend playing whatever. And I was like, okay, sweet. So I went down to stay with them and she was like, you're pretty good. And I was like, thanks. So she calls me like a month later and she was like, Hey, my band is coming to LA and I signed you up to open for us for 40 minutes. And I was like, Holy fuck. I mean, I've been on the stages before and on cameras and shit, but like playing on stage is a little different. And I was like, okay, like when is it? She's like, it's in a month. And I was like, where is it? She's like, it's at the house of blues in Hollywood. I'm like, holy fuck. So my first time playing live on stage was at the house of blues in Hollywood. <laughs> and I was like, so fucked up. Now. But I like, I played for probably six hours a day for the whole month my fingers like fucking bleeding so like really <laughs> my guitar and singing thing but 
I just was like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to do it. Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? Like, maybe if I'm bad enough, I'll get hit in the head with a beer bottle or something. But I doubt that's going to happen. And so I was talking with my one of my best one of my best friends down here, and he was like, I was like, will you play? Like, will you play with me? He's like, no, I couldn't play. I'd freeze up. I'm like, dude, I don't even know how to play. Like, well, I'm not, <laughs> like, who gives a shit? And I, I just like some people, they just can't do it. They can't like take that risk even though nothing's gonna happen to them it's kind of it's kind of sad but it's like i don't know i'm okay with failing that's for sure yeah it's hard when you don't understand your own operating system and i think like people like you and i understand conquering our own fear because we've done it and right. you know we've been forced to in a lot of settings right. and like our internal operating system will tell us that we're gonna die even like just because we have a severe anxiety in social situations, you know, like the fight or flight reaction will be like, you're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it literally is just like your amygdala is like way too much input. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. I like, I might, you know, and that's, it's hard for a lot of people to like grasp what the operating system that we've been given and then go out and be like, okay, you think you're going to die. Like you're, you know, you're, you're dumping adrenaline, but really you're just getting on stage and a bunch of people are looking at yeah, you. Like that's it's it. not the end of the world, you know, but yeah, I was just having a conversation about this. I think I, it's from like, uh, if you were out in like in the fields and a bunch of eyes were on you, yeah. most of the time you're about to die. Yeah. Because like way back in the day, cause animals, you know, yeah. So that's what I've heard is like the fight or flight response or why, why that happens. But it is, it's hard because people let their, hey there, What's up, dog? people, <laughs> <laughs> he's trying hey, to dog. say hello. Um, <laughs> people let their own like questions just keep them in a cage of not doing things. Yeah. And that gets like, I almost let myself get like, get in the way of starting this podcast. And now I'm sitting here talking to you and like claim was one of my favorite ski movies I've ever, you know, I've ever watched. And, um, you know, like I hit up JT Holmes and he was like, yeah, I know about the podcast. And it's like, if I never would have just gone out and done it, then I wouldn't have made these connections. Yeah. And so dude, like just jumping out and, and doing it, I think is super important no matter what it is. Like obviously you have to mitigate risk, yeah. but yeah, I had a hard time, like, um, it was a lot harder making the transition out of skiing. Like, I was definitely way too in my head with that same type of thing, like, fight or flight coming in all the time because I, like, what the trail I was going to do with my life. Like, it immediately felt like I didn't have any value because, like, I didn't have any sponsors anymore. Like, didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't, I never made money any other way. Like, I've had, I had jobs when I was younger, but I can't even get a job. Like, I don't have any, <laughs> any ability. Like, I've never, worked at a restaurant i've never done anything and it was like when when things weren't i like tried doing you know music stuff and entertainment stuff that type of thing and when some of those things don't work immediately and you're like well i don't have anything to fall back on it's fucking terrifying so like the fight or flight shit i know all about that i had like was having panic attacks and stuff and it was literally just because i was mentally fucking unsure what was going to be happening yep. yeah yeah it's also like when you have that association with your identity, you're like, I am a professional skier. I am this person. Yeah. And then like you, like you disassociate your identity with being that person. You're like, okay, so who am I now? Yeah. And that can shake you to the core. You know, you're like, well, I don't even know who I am. Yeah. Who am I without <laughs> this big, this world that I was part of the small world that I was part of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And like asking the universe for some sign of like direction and it's, it's really hard. I think once you have excelled in one area to accept being a novice in other areas, oh, yeah, that's, it's fucking impossible for you. Like you can't even, yeah, I feel like it's impossible to know or to be prepared for that part of it. Yeah. Well, is definitely. Now fucking, he's in a surgeon. <laughs> he was he went to school like he while he was a pro skier and like competing in x games and shit he went to school 
for math and graduated like second in his class or something for mathematics while he was a pro skier. And then after that, he went and became a doctor. And now he's a surgeon. So he kind of had his shit figured out. But for the most part, I think that people, yeah, when you get out of, get out of the sport, you're like, what the fuck am I going to do now? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think I, uh, I'm going to have an event here in New York teaching athletes how to become influencers and entrepreneurs and like find their voice after being in professional athletics, like teaching people how to like, you know, use what they've done to tell stories like write books or like, you know, like start a podcast. I'm going to let my dog out real quick. Hold up. (laughs) What's up dog? (laughs) sorry about that but yeah yeah i think that it's super important for you know like athletes to know that (laughs) it's hard to do that and it's hard to like for me i had a big disassociation i was like uh, i grew up ski racing and i was like constantly told when i was like 13 14 15 that i was going to be on the u.s ski team if i just continued on with what i was doing i was crushing it you know top three in the nation for my age at one point and stuff like that. And then it all fizzled out. And I was like, what do I do now? You know, like who am I supposed to be? And, and that, that was definitely, I would say one of the hardest times in my life. Cause I just didn't, I didn't know. And I didn't want skiing to be what made me happy, even though it was what made me happy, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I was like, nope. I didn't want, well, go ahead. I didn't want that to be the thing that was, like a part of my person or a part of my identity, but it was so much that I like uh, just like went to war against myself in a big way. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely had that same experience and they don't, nobody really, like I was saying with value, like once you're done being a pro skier and you don't have sponsors and stuff, no one gives a fuck. Like, and no one prepares you for that either. You're basically told you're, you're told from a young age that you're, you're the best in the world or that you're going to be or whatever. And that's all you really know and think. And it's like pushed into you the entire time. And then when you're done, people are like, well, did you have fun? And you're like, wait, what do you mean? Like, what, <laughs> what the fuck what <laughs> the fucking do now? I mean, I got lucky cause I'm good at some other shit as well that I enjoy, but like some people get really fucked up about it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, mm, there's all, a- he, had like, he had some fucking serious problems with like substances and shit like that. And, and drinking and it's just like it's just shitty yeah yeah definitely especially like i think in the 2000s there was kind of this big party scene vibe and there was also like a lot of progression that was going on i think like head injuries weren't really talked about very big or very much and then like you know that can also have a big uh for me, it had a big impact. I like, I was drinking and I had had multiple head injuries and I don't know like what the combination of of everything was, but things just became too overwhelming, you know? And it was like, uh, I, I stopped drinking, stopped eating sugar and, uh, really made sure that I like protected my head. And ever since then, you know, life's been a lot better, but it's like, I don't know. It's hard to you just life can change so quickly and so drastically. Yeah. How does the so. no sugar thing, what, what's the deal with that? Um, sugar just seems to spike my anxiety. Yeah. Like I'll eat sugar from fruit cause fructose is good for, for yeah. you. Um, but no, yeah, no processed sugar, like no candy bars, no soda, nothing like that. Yeah. And like, I don't eat that much fruit. And even the like the fruit that I do eat are like blueberries are really low in sugar. Yeah. Um. But. Well, that's cool. It. I think like sugar and alcohol had a relationship in my body where they kind of like because alcohol get, basically gets processed into sugar. Yeah. So. I think that um, just eating sugar would give me anxiety because I definitely like I had some times where. 
I like lost some friends and was partying and like doing, you know, like doing all these things where I was kind of, I was definitely using alcohol to run from my reality. It wasn't just uh, an aid to having fun at all. And um, yeah, like that happened for long enough that I was like, you know, can't do that anymore. Got myself in some trouble. Yeah. And uh, yeah, do you have any specific diet or like routines that you stick to that have helped you with the the panic attacks? Like, do you find like meditation or or like just being around friends yeah, or anything like that? Slowing down with drinking for sure. Like, and and I mean, luckily for me, I think I can control it well enough where like I don't I can recognize when I'm like I want to go get drunk or go party and not and it's not for a good thing so it's like i just stay away from that type of thing i don't only drink or party or hang out when there's like a purpose to it you know like a purpose as in you're hanging out with friends or whatever and shit like that but um i don't know for me with the anxiety it was like you know someone was saying i should get like a prescription at uh, xanax or something and i was like well, fuck. I mean, what am I going to do? Take Xanax for the rest of my fucking life. And the, the only thing for me was just getting down to the root of figuring out where the anxiety actually comes from. Like, um, so weird having a panic attack. It's so embarrassing. It, that's how I felt. I felt embarrassed that I couldn't control my body because I like obviously coming from skiing and doing entertainment and stuff. You're like, your body is your way of expressing yourself and that type of thing. And to have my body shutting down on me or like freaking out on me was really put me in my own head and so really thinking about what it what it was was that I wanted or what what it was is that I just hadn't figured out what it, I really wanted to be or do so instead of worrying too much about whether I was or not I just kind of switched into well I'm gonna try everything then so that's why I like writing movies and fucking playing music and doing all these different things and not worrying as much and just letting things happen somehow I've been yeah. continue doing it in a way where like right now I've also gotten into drift car driving, which is pretty fucking sweet and building a drift car. And that <laughs> definitely helped pull me out like a couple years ago of, of being too anxious and all that stuff. Cause I'm still working with monster and they're supporting me and doing, we're doing like a four part series about building the drift car and it's super fun. And it's just like, a whole new world. so I guess doing that's more like for me, I actually doesn't do, um, who was it? I guess maybe it was like Tim Ferriss. I'm not like a huge Tim Ferriss guy, but I like listening to some of his podcasts where there was people that I like. Have you ever listened to him? Love Tim yeah. Ferriss for sure. Yeah, I like yeah. I mean, I I like and I listen to his stuff sometimes. He gets a little too into the things that he's into, and I kind of want him to like get back to the person that he's interviewing. Uh, yeah, talk about tea for like 45 minutes, and I'm like, I don't talk about tea, and I'm not going to drink that shit. So <laughs> I do like tea though. But anyway, he was like, but he interviewed um, Jamie Foxx, I think it was. And Jamie Foxx was like, and no matter what happens, like he was talking about his, his like distant cousin or something wanted money for a surgery. And he was like, I'll, I'll pay for your surgery for sure. And she was like, no, I want the money from it. And she's just trying to get money out of him. And he was just all these different things. And, and, he, and I think Tim was asking him that same thing. Well, how do you deal with it? And he was saying that you just got to keep pushing forward. And I heard that like a couple of years ago and, and that kind of sparked me into being like, okay, well, I can't control whether I'm going to be anxious, that type of thing. What I can't control is doing what I'm going to be doing and more of it if I want to, you know? So that's, I guess, action is the way that I try to combat anxiety. Yeah, totally. One thing that I've like been told by a mentor before and rediscovered lately is that like why is just a maddening question yeah. if you constantly are asking the universe why yeah. instead of just like what and how yeah. so like what you're gonna do and how you're gonna do it what like what's happening and how are you gonna react to it you know like those two questions seem to be like very applicable and logical paths why is just like especially when it's if it involves another person asking why it's just like so maddening. Yeah, it's impossible. Yeah. yeah. yeah don't know about anything. But yeah, I, I definitely like I've dealt with depression before as well. And like, you know, I think that 
just, yeah, just getting out and doing and like making yourself go and do things. Um, another one of my mentors says commitment is doing what you said you're going to do after the feeling you set it in is gone. Mm-hmm. And like being able to commit to doing things. Cause like, I know what it is to have like panic or, or depression or anxiety. And you're like, you can say you want to do something when you're in a good mood, but then like it comes down to it. And all of a sudden your feelings are completely different. You're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> no <it's> way different. <laughs> yeah. But you know, getting, once you can kind of like break that ice a couple times for me and I like, it, it was repetitive breaking of the ice definitely before I was like really comfortable in, in social situations again after college, after some things that I did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it definitely, I love that. Just like getting out and doing for sure. Do you, have you ever like stuck to any diet or routine or like done any sort of like uh gym work or like anything like that? No, I never really, I know even as a skier, I never went to the gym or anything. I just fucking hate that shit so much. I don't hate the actual act of doing it. I just, I can't, I'd rather go do something like recently. Yeah. I decided I actually, I think what I might start doing is fucking Kung Fu or something. I was thinking about learning Muay Thai because that's the most violent one. I thought that would be kind of cool. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of kicking and flipping and shit, which I really like doing. And, yeah. Um, and then the other thing I did is I got a um, a cruiser bike down here and I put a, it's a girl's cruiser bike. It's just a piece of shit. And I was like, I kind of wish I knew how to do wheelies. And my friend was like, you don't know how to do wheelies. I feel like of all people, you should know how to do fucking wheelies. And I was like, yeah, I know. Right. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to learn how to do wheelies. So I put a back brake on. I have my buddy put a, he isn't, I don't know why I overkill. I fucking had my airplane mechanic buddy put a fucking back brake on it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, now I've been learning how to do wheelies and I can pretty much ride. It's a really beat up piece of shit bike with actually back pedaling is the usual brake. So sometimes yep. serious shit, but it took me about, yep. I'd say about four or five months and now I can do wheelies pretty consistently. I'm excited to try a different bike cause I've never tried it on any other bike besides this piece of shit girls cruiser bike. <laughs> it's pretty fun though, <laughs> cruising down like by the beach, just doing wheelies and shit. People are like, Oh, we cool buddy. And you're like, Hey, it's, yeah, it's pretty hilarious. So that, I mean, that doesn't really, I don't know if that counts as exercise, but I have to be doing something. I can't just be fucking sitting in a gym and, that type of thing it doesn't work for me yeah yeah totally i think um you know as skiers like we're used to constant stimulus and if it's just kind of the same thing it, it can be i don't know yeah i started to really like the gym after i like got in trouble with the law and like started to focus on my diet because it was a, a place that i could like refine myself and yeah. like it was a little bit i don't know but I had so much resistance to the gym for so long. Like, no, cannot do it. Yeah. Once I finally did, very much enjoyed it, though. Yeah, that's definitely me. I feel like if I ever, like, I, I, I thought about, like, if I ever was in a movie or something like that, that I would be my excuse to fucking, like, if I had a purpose for what I was doing and it wasn't just, like, I want to stay in shape, then, like, <laughs> like I needed to, I want to, like, man, I'm going to see. I was thinking about, actually, when I was in uh, college for that one year, me and my buddies were like, let's see how many push-ups we can do in a row. And so for a month straight, we did push-ups. I did push-ups every other day and I'd go do as many as I could until I couldn't do anymore. And then I'd stop for like two, like a minute. And then I'd do them again until I couldn't do them anymore. And then I'd stop for a minute until I couldn't do one. And I'd do that every yep. other day. And I got to the point where I could do like 130 push-ups or something all in a row. And I was like, yep, yeah, okay, that's done. Like what task are we going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> that's more the way I operate. I'm not like a the the constant thing where it's just like where there's no end goal really. I mean, I get it if you're like trying to lose weight, or you're trying to do something, but just like staying healthy and doing it to do it, like and forcing yourself to do something is like there's got to be better ways of doing that. That's like that's yeah for me anyway. That's like not how my brain works. I can't do yep, that unless so. there's actually like a full on purpose to it. Yeah, like I for example the way I dress too. I just, I wear things that were given to me for free or are super cheap. 
and that's it. Like I don't, Dossie's like super fashion guy. He always makes fun of me for the shit I wear. I wear like dragon t-shirts and shit. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Like this has no purpose. It's so, it's so weird to me. I've had like girlfriends before being like, don't just try a little bit. And I'm like, I don't care. Like it just seems so vain to me. <laughs> it's just so weird because yeah. it's like your clothes and you're like your style, that type of thing. Yeah. You you probably have enough style in your personality that you don't need you don't need clothes to fucking make a statement. <laughs> no, I don't know. But the like I wear Heelys to the airport because they're fucking sweet. I don't give a fuck what you think of my fucking shoes. Like anybody i don't give a shit it's like <laughs> these are perfect because i can go through the airport super fast and they're right? sick yeah that's awesome how do you uh like is that just something that just makes sense to you or did you ever have to like convince yourself to not give a fuck about what anyone thinks or or what younger when i was like a, i guess well, I guess I was, I was in elementary school for sure. And I refused to wear jeans. So I think it's not just that I don't give a fuck. It's that I'm sort of on the other side of it where like, I refuse to wear jeans because everybody else is wearing fucking jeans. And that was yep. the only reason the, my mom and my sister tried to get me to wear jeans like all the time. And I'm like, they're like, see, look, other people like them and they're comfortable. And that, I think they didn't realize that was my main reasoning for not wanting to wear jeans was because everybody else was fucking wearing them. I did the same thing up until eighth grade. I finally wore jeans, but I wore cargo pants yeah. because freaking that was cooler than wearing jeans because everyone else was wearing jeans. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. I, I wore like, oh my God, elementary school. I wore like the fuck because it was like the early 90s or it was like the mid 90s. So I'd wear like those pants with the fucking shit all over them, like jazzy fucking 90s shit. <laughs> Not because I was making a fashion statement, it's just like the only pants my mom could find that I would wear because they weren't jeans. <laughs> it was like, yep. Yeah. And then I would wear Carhartts. Like I used to even wear fucking, I would wear Carhartts going skiing. And I, that was one of the things that, that, that reinforced it for me as well is because I would go skiing and people in skiing like would be like, what are you wearing Carhartts for? That's like stupid. And then I would go out and be so much better than them at skiing. And it was like, this shit doesn't matter. Like the thing that we're here to do is be good at this shit. If you like doing it, it doesn't matter what the fuck you look like, what the fuck you're wearing. I mean, yep. there is a change with that, with like the actual equipment. Once you get to that level, like, like with skis, like I designed a pair of skis because that's the best fucking option for what those were. So I don't mean in like the technical, I mean, in the technical way, I mean like the, the, like, and I get if something's inhibiting you, like if I was wearing tight jeans and it was hard to like do tricks or whatever, then don't wear the fucking tight jeans, but you can wear a dupe. Uh, <laughs> Jossie. Yeah. No, okay, yeah. Yeah. I don't even know if he still does wear it. I don't think he, I don't even know. I'm just joking around. Yeah. People get all buttered about that. Like, uh, like <clears throat> about like people not using poles and shit was a big deal for a while. And it was like, I fucking hated that people got upset about that. Like, it's like, just fucking, then, then you pulls yourself. Like who gives a fuck, man? Like who the fuck are you to say what this sport is or isn't? You sound like the exact people that we're trying to be different from right now. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the things about the skiing industry is like, they try to avoid being elitist by being elitist. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> it's because they want to, I mean, I think in some cases it's because they want to be, it's definitely elitist. That's a good way to put it. Cause I, I mean, I would always try to describe it, but it, I, I, I hated that shit. But um, what was, like, what was my thought on that? Uh, yeah, it's definitely like elitist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, I really like the skiing, but I never like when I was young, I felt uncomfortable as fuck when I would walk into like a ski shop. Like people would like love to go in there and buy the most expensive shit and like people hang in there and they're like, what's the flex on your skis and shit? And I'm like, I don't fucking know, motherfucker. I don't give a shit. Like, yep. I I felt so uncomfortable and and one of the things I kind of I don't know why I have this stupid fire that doesn't make sense because it's just stubborn. I look like an asshole. But it's like this feeling I have where like we go into a ski shop and like someone wouldn't know I was a pro skier or whatever. And I'd be like, can you, can I do, can you, can I have those? And they're like, you don't want those, man. That's not going to help or improve whatever. And I just be like, motherfucker, like, 
uh, and I've never, I would never say anything, but in my mind, I'm just in my mind, like, fuck you, dude. Like, this is my job. Like I'm way better at this shit than you are. And you're trying to fucking be like, ah, I hate that shit. That's what I'm saying. It's a stupid fire that makes you just look arrogant. But I have that. I've had that since I was little of like, why the fuck can't I do that? Like, fuck you. <laughs> I think that's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. I think also we get so like, we think that there are these one size fits all like blueprints that everyone should fit into. And it's like, if Jossie should not be in a, like a one thirty flex boot ever, probably, you know, depending on like what he's doing. And it's like, it, 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 but maybe he really likes it. And so maybe that's what he does use and it works for him. So like, who are you to tell him, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah that's definitely. Everyone thinks that you need to fit in a box or that you should fit in a box. Yeah, that, there that is, is one box. of my problems with like the whole coaching scenario and shit like that. It's like, I didn't, I didn't really, I mean, if you want to do coaching, that's fucking sweet. But everybody they met that was in the coaching system, they're like, just fucking goobers, man. They're like, but it, goobers in the way of like, they thought there was a formula to what the fuck we were doing. And the only formula that I could possibly say there is, is doing it a fucking gajillion times. If you try to do a switch five, if you've never done it, you try to do it a gajillion times, you're going to learn how to fucking do it. And that's like the part that I thought was cool is that I didn't learn the right way to do stuff. So like I used to do a switch Misty seven, but the reason I learned switch Misty seven is because I want to learn how to do switch sevens, but I couldn't, I felt uncomfortable taking off. I always felt like I was going to catch my tips. So instead I would mm -hmm. take off on my left edges and throw my shoulder down towards the jump and spin that way. And I won like a whole bunch of competitions because it was original, but all it was was me not doing it the other way and incapable, like incapable of doing it and stubborn as fuck that I was not going to learn it the other way. Like I'm going to learn how to do it my own fucking way. And that yeah. was like, I, that was one of the things I really liked about the skiing and that type of thing. And so now that it's like way more like, um, coached and judged and there's one more criteria and like how you should be doing things it's like that's why i like i still like harlow you know he looks fucking sweet he's like doing nose butter triples like i remember i watched that i'm sure you maybe you did maybe you didn't but a bunch of people i'm sure have seen it was like tanner hall talking to um henry mm -hmm. harlow at the top of x games yeah like, totally. that's not he's like you got this you got the triple you got the nose butter triple and he's like but that's not like cool though and he goes fuck are you fucking kidding me you tell people what's cool like you this is you this is fucking you do it and he's like okay and it's like such a sick fucking little speech from tanner that was i had goosebumps i was sitting down at the bottom in like a trailer or something or somewhere and you could hear him talking i was like this is fucking magical right now but it, yeah like I don't know where I was going with that, but that's, he's an example of someone who's still in it that I, I just love the way that he's doing exactly what he wants to be doing and still crushing it. Cause there's like, I mean, the thing is, I don't want to hate on people who are being coached because it's not that it's not necessarily them. It just reminds me of like, I, I hung out with Nick Gepper a couple of times because I was trying to maybe like figure out if I did want to be coached, which for sure I I had a bunch of different tries at coaches and I was like, this is fucking worthless. But I was talking with him and he was like, yeah, I just learned how to do that trick. Like that this guy did it and that guy did it like that. And I was like, just thinking to myself, like they broke down everything that everybody else was doing and then learned how to do it. And I was like, I don't, I just don't get that mentality. Like the, the, the joy you get from doing something your own specific way and then getting rewarded for it is fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know? Good yeah, I saw that switch. I don't even know. I think it was a switch double 10. Uh, that Henrik, he just won whatever event it was. It was one of the, one of those city big airs. Yeah. They put up all the scaffolding. Yeah. And the slag on it, it was just so good. It looked so lazy, yeah. dude. So lazy. I love how the sport has progressed. Like you see the crazy like <clears throat> Andre Rigotli – uh doing the quad last year and stuff like that but then you also have like real ski fi and like the people who are out there getting super creative in that aspect as well i think it's cool that the the sport has progressed a ton in that area where like people are working out super hard they're breaking down the tricks they're making sure that their grabs are like you know like two inches down the tail and you know like <laughs> 
articulated in, in a certain way at a certain degree and, and everything. It's, and then you also have the people out there that are like, uh, we're going to ski on skateboards and do flips into rivers and, you know, yeah. so yeah, I think, I think it's cool that that's, it's gone in a multitude of different ways, you know, yeah, which I think is fucking sweet. I can't stand when people like we were talking about before. I can't stand when people give people shit for something that they're doing on their own. That actually, to me, even that's like, even with fucking rollerblading, like I don't personally rollerblade, but it really fucking pisses me off when people call rollerbladers like names and shit. And they're like mad at them. And it's like, well, why the fuck do you give a fuck, dude? <laughs> who gives a shit all you're looking like is an insecure piece of fuck like who cares if someone's on fucking rollerblade or a goddamn scooter and then someone will be like well they're always in the way i'm like how fuck are they in your fucking way any more than a goddamn pedestrian like what the fuck are you talking about? or like whatever any excuses they have it's like dude i don't know i don't know if you back me on that one but like i 110 yeah, percent. i fucking hate that shit so much even with jossie like jossie used to rollerblade harlow used to rollerblade and it made them way better fucking skiers for it. And now Jossie's like fucking rollerblading so fucking stupid. And I'm like, dude, who cares, man? Also, you used to be nasty at it. You used to be able to do flips and shit. And you watch him ski pipe and you're like, that's one of the reasons he's so fucking good at pipe is because he's so good at transitions. You don't have any balance this way. It's just this way on rollerblades. It's like when I when they were talking about the Olympics, I had no interest really in going to the Olympics. I like tried to psych myself up to think that I wanted to. The only thing I think of doing if I was going to go for half pipe was fucking building a vert ramp in my backyard and starting rollerblading. Like I've never rollerbladed before, but like, I was like, if I can do a double in a pipe on rollerblades, you know, fucking nasty. You'd be in a fucking half pipe on ski. <laughs> right. Gnarly. Even like at a skateboard or something like that, like just practicing those transitions. I mean, like that's why fucking Sean white is so fucking nasty. at snowboard half pipe. It bolts yeah. all the time because if you landed on an edge on a skateboard, you're fucked. Like, as yeah. thing lands like directly square center every single time. Yeah. But I didn't really want to go to the Olympics, so I didn't do that. But yeah, I'm glad you're on the same page with me that because I have conversations with people about that and they can't explain to me why they think it's fucking stupid or whatever. I had this huge conversation one time with all these campers because I don't really skateboard that much either. I mean, I can kind of skateboard, I can't do any tricks or anything, but I was at camp and i was like coming down off the mountain i was super hungover but they were like can you can you take the kid it was like the day off or something like can you take the kids skateboarding and i was like i don't know how to fucking skate. yeah all right so i like brought like this group of campers skateboarding and i purposely was carrying my skateboard by the trucks and they were like why are you like you look so stupid right now i'm like why and they're like you're carrying it by the trucks i'm like who gives a fucking shit dude like i'll carry it by a wheel if i want to like what does it have to do with my yeah. skills on a fucking skateboard? And I kind of like used it as a segue to explain to them about like that type of thing and how you didn't have to fit in all that shit. I just remember at one point, um, there's one kid, they all actually ended up not really skate. They just kind of like sat around me in a circle. I was just telling them stories about skiing and all these different things and being a pro skier and all that shit. And, and so then I was like, yeah, I'm like carrying your skateboard, however the fuck you want. You can fucking go rollerblading if you want. You can do whatever the fuck you want. And this one kid, I remember he looks at me, he's probably about 12 or 13 and he's like looking at me and then he's like kind of looking off in the distance and I was just watching him and then he looks back and he goes, it doesn't matter. And I was like, yeah, there you go, buddy. I, yes. like, just fucking, I just remember him, this, his brain just fucking exploded. It was like, it doesn't matter. And I was like, you're right. Nothing matters if you're enjoying it, fucking do it, dude. That was probably uh, one of the, I'm really glad that I did those kids skateboarding because all I wanted to do is go home and fucking take a nap. But that was really worth it. <laughs> uh, that is awesome. Yeah, kids. Well, I might have to get going here in a minute. I'm supposed to go down and got to watch some fucking, some fucking NBA with my boys. Sure. Well, let's end it with the, the same question I always ended on. on it's uh, what, if you could have one significant impact in the world, what would it be? <laughs> uh, I would like to, um, I used to be when I like before. Wait, does that have to be a one word answer or something? I was gonna... <laughs> Dude, no, not at all. I was, make it whatever. Uh, I guess before I would say that I wanted to entertain or at least reach the most amount of people possible. And I kind of have changed that because that came with a whole bunch of anxiety as we were talking about of like, I'm not reaching enough, I'm not doing enough, I'm not working hard enough to reach more and more people. And then, um, then 
I guess what I think about now is I want to do a better job or at least make sure that the people around me are entertained and enjoying themselves. I think that sounds really kind of weird, but I think that really is what it is because before it was like, I wanted to try to entertain the world and I wanted to be like an icon, not because not necessarily because I wanted, you know, for my ego side of it. But then I realized that really is pretty much for my ego side of it, wanting to entertain that many people, just wanting to get to that many people. Not because I wanted to be famous or recognized, but the fame sort of seemed like it was something that came with being good at your job in entertaining and making people feel good. But I think I would change it now to, I really, I still think about it and worry about it, but I really would like to stop worrying so much about the amount of people that I entertain and start thinking more about the quality of the entertainment or the feelings that I'm giving them. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Definitely. Love that. Love that answer. Mm, That'll do. Dude, thank you so much for your time, spending quite a bit of time with me.